I'll just put a, <laughs> a, a right. Um, I think given that we're talking about your background already, uh, let's dive into it and actually start your talk and then come back to the chit chat afterwards again. Um, mm -hmm. We're live on YouTube um, and people are already writing comments over there. Fantastic. If you have questions throughout the talk, feel free to write them on the chat on YouTube and the chat over here on Zoom. I will pick them up and then Lauren Tibo will later lead the Q&A with uh, Sophie. Um, well, welcome to the CNS talk. We're absolutely thrilled to have you here. Um, from my understanding uh, from your CV was that you have a background in AI and philosophy, cognitive science and neuroscience, which is a very intriguing combination. And we certainly have a few questions for you on that. Um, your PhD was on mapping inter individual differences, tracking plasticity of the social brain using longitudinal structural MRI data. Um, and again, there will be many questions coming your way um, related to that topic as well. Um, and now you're leading a cognitive neurogenetics uh, Otto Hahn research group which is quite exciting. And the three research axes are large-scale brain organization, evolution and development, and behavior, brain, and body interactions. And uh, today we hear the talk on shaping brain structure and function, and we're super excited. So I'm gonna give the floor to you, Sophie, to take it away, and I'll see you afterwards. Thank you. Okay, yeah, um, thank you for the nice introduction. I guess part of the reason why I studied philosophy because I'm named Sophie, so I felt sort of an obligation um, to dive deeper into um, that element. Um, but yeah, happy to explain people uh, uh, how I did this uh, broad package and why um, after, but like, let's focus now maybe on um, the talk. <laughs> So um, yeah, it's about shaping the cortex and actually um, the shaping uh, part comes from my latest paper, uh, which is called the shape of brain sh shaping brain structure, um, which was inspired by the moving the shape of water, uh, which I thought was really lovely. But um, yeah, that, this is more a side note. So I'm Sophie and um, yeah, thank you all for being here. And um, I'm a little bit nervous, but I hope I'll um, calm down while talking. So, um, human behavior. So we start with behavior and then we will speak about the brain and go to more genetic and evolutionary roots that help us understand human behavior. Because as you see here also, the heads are covered in smoke. Human behavior is complex and sometimes difficult to understand. But the place where it's generated is uh, the brain. And the brain um, is a network of different regions which are organized along certain um, streams of processing that go back and forth as you see here with these arrows and I guess a lot of my work has been heavily influenced by um, Marcel Mesulam but also other Olaf Sporns other people that have cool ideas and important ideas about the brain as a network so like using this notion of the brain of the network you see that there are certain organizational axes so I don't know can you see my mouse Stephanie? Yeah. Okay. So for example, you have one axis that goes from visual here to um, auditory processing, but you also have an axis going from um, unimodal or ideotypic unimodal to paralimbic limbic region. So there's different um, axes or like on a map, you have like the upper part and lower part, but you also have left and right. So you can see this brain organization as a multidimensional space in which certain behaviors um, are embedded. At least that is maybe the, the thesis that I will try to convince you of during this talk. Um, so there have been other people um, that have already shown this actually, uh, in my opinion. So organization supports behavior. So um, Daniel Margulis in 2016 could show that the principal gradient of intrinsic functional connectivity aligned with um, task-based behavior going from motor via visual spatial auditory processing cognitive control to emotion and social cognition at the apex of this gradient you see it here in red which is mainly also the default mode on the other hand there are also other like spatial patterns in this multi-dimensional axis and one of the other one the third one namely that explains um like the third amount of um, variance is um a dissociation between the task positive networks or the uh, multiple demand networks versus the default mode networks here in um, blue and red. 
And you see that this is also a differentiation between on tasks and off task. Um, and this may also be helping you like to focus on tension on the external world versus like more uh, introspection, thinking about your own thoughts, maybe theory of mind. So you see that there are like multiple shapes or multiple organizational axes in the brain that relate also in how different behaviors are dissociable. So taking these thoughts with us, um, I can conclude that the brain is an organized network and this organization reflects different behavioral axes, dissociating on the one hand perception action from more social cognition and theory of mind, but on the other hand, also dissociating theory of mind from more um, attention processing. So my question is now, how are these behaviors that make us human embedded in the intrinsic connectome? So yeah, what are behaviors that make us human? Um, and Stephanie already uh, kindly said that I have a background in social neuroscience, so I'm also trained to see it like this, but I do believe that human interaction and the way that we think about other people and we have our memories and we think about other people's thoughts and we have complex emotions such as empathy or compassion for others makes us human. And that's why I think it's interesting to investigate them and understand how they relate to this brain organization. So um, the starting point of this study, which is a preprint, and I'm currently also updating it for resubmission. Um, and um, the starting point is three tasks, namely an attention task, the Q-Flanker task, and the Empathom task that measures compassion uh, after an emotional video or a neutral video. And it also measures theory of mind by means of a theory of mind question versus a no theory of mind question. And what you see that each of these tasks have a different um, activation contrast. And when you plot this on the brain, I see something nice, and maybe you see this with me. Um, you see namely a sequence of this pattern. So it's always yellow, red, light green, which is the overlap between red and green and darker green. And here you also see yellow, even pink, which is the overlap between attention and affect, red, green, yellow, red, green. So it seems that there's some organization in these behaviors and how they're spread across the brain. And this might also like be interesting to investigate further using this notion of brain organization because it helps us to understand what are these major axes that shape our brain and behavior. So when you align this with resting state gradients, um, the nicest dissociation is actually along gradient three about which I spoke before that dissociates this internal cognitive processing such as theory of mind, but also this external um, cognitive processing such as attention as you see also here. So you see here attention in the middle is more this affective processing and on the lower part is this theory of mind. On the other hand, you also see that the principal gradient which dissociates unimodal to transmodal regions mainly dissociates um, this attention from social affective and social cognitive behaviors. So it seems indeed that these intrinsic gradients, as Daniel Magris also showed, um, and also um, Turnbull, can dissociate these three behaviors that all relate to social interaction. Um, and the other part, and, and this is also related, when you combine these gradients or all these gradients, they also reflect a segregation between networks. So if you move back here, you see that this gradient also reflects that the difference or the segregation between the functional connectivity profile of unimodal regions, such as sensory motor and visual regions, and the default mode region is here maximally different. So it's maximally segregated. And the same holds true for the other endpoints of the gradient. So here, multiple demand and default mode network are maximally different. So when you combine the first three gradients, you get an overall notion of like um, cortex-wide eccentricity, which is a measure of the integration or the segregation of specific networks. And the more or the lower the eccentricity, the least these networks are se segregated, meaning they're never at an endpoint of a gradient, but more in the middle, having a little bit of that, like a little bit of default mode, but also a little bit of sensory motor connectivity. Um, and you see, if you look at this segregation um, measure here, that there is not so much difference actually between these three tasks. So all are like, maybe attention is least, is most integrated, meaning that it has a lot of connectivity profiles to like all kinds of regions. Whereas you see that in social affect and social cognition, it's both part of like uh, integrated networks, but also part of like these more segregated networks, such as the default mode network. Um, 
And also, like, um, Janine Beister both had a paper in Nature um, Neuroscience Reviews where she spoke also about that too many people rely too many, much on their own method to understand a certain phenomenon. So um, to overcome this criticism, maybe for me focusing solely on gradients, I also took a graph theoretical approach to validate this more gradient based notion of like network segregation and integration. Um, and I also evaluated clustering co coefficient, which is sort of an index to how regions are clustered with themselves and path length. And you see that actually this eccentricity measure, which should represent segregation and integration, correlates quite highly with both other measures that are based on graph theoretical notions of brain organization. So this is kind of nice, is that the concept that I try to describe is something that you also can describe in different um, methodological languages, so to say. Um, and then we get to the second part because it's nice that these functions are sort of differently embedded in the brain and, and, and it's nice that they align with these gradients and they help us to understand what they represent and what they are. But on the other hand, this has already like in part, like people have shown similar things and it's, it's interesting, but not that novel. And what we wanted also to know is how these axes, like this multidimensional space of connectivity would change when you train these skills. So we had three modules of different trainings in two training cohorts and one a third cohort which trained only affect and a retest control cohort what did, who did nothing but were only tested. So as you see here the training cohort both were like about 80 people whereas the retest control cohorts were uh, in together 90 people and the training cohort three was also, also 81 people. So first, um, they started with presence training, which is about attention and interoceptive awareness. So you sit down and you do breathing exercises or you do like a body scan that you might know from a yoga class. The affective training on the other hand was about nurturing care, compassion, pro-social behavior and dealing with difficult emotions. So there you have to first um, sit by yourself and create feelings of, of kindness and gratitude to like your friends, which is like hopefully easy, but then you expand this to other people, such as the man or the lady behind the counter at the bakery, to the people you do not like. So in the, in the end, you have like these feelings of warmth and like compassion for like all the people on the planet so that you an ally with them. And on the other hand, we trained this by social interaction. So you have to speak about difficult emotions and positive emotions that you experience during your day with a partner. So in this case, I only see Stephanie because I made the screen quite small, but we had like a phone call and first I speak three minutes of the positive things that happened to me today. And then I speak two minutes of the negative things that happened to me today and she listens. And then we switch roles and then she does the same and I listen to her experiences. And then the last training block, which was perspective, um, is about metacognition, perspective taking on the self, but also perspective taking on the other. Um, and this was trained on the one hand by like sitting and watching your um, thoughts going by as if you're in a train station. So letting go that you know, okay, this is just a thought that I have, but it will come and go. But it was also about um, social interaction again, but this time you speak about different perspectives you have in yourself. So you have certain experiences during your day and these you experience in different roles. For example, um, now I'm giving a lecture and I'm speaking and I'm thinking, okay, how do I tell this clearly? Oh no, I spoke too fast. Like, like it's already like, how is time passing? Are people still interested? Um, but sometimes I'm also a listener like you guys and you are maybe like, why is she talking so fast? Or I cannot see her hands move or, oh, how interesting with what do these colors mean? And all these perspectives make you also perceive the same situation. Like we're all in this Zoom quite differently. And I have also other roles. So such as earlier we spoke about that I'm a mother, but I also I am on Instagram and then these things like influence how I perceive certain things. And um, this idea that you realize that we all have different roles and perspectives in our lives were, were like, was the idea that with this, you can like improve also your perspective taking abilities because you kind of know, okay, this person is not only a student, but he or she is also a teacher or he or she is also a mother or a child of people. And that makes this or them behave in certain ways. So we trained this and I guess these colors are key. So presence is yellow, affect is red and perspective module is green. And we switched the second two things. So first we do now a small meditation exercise so that I can breathe a little bit and you too. So you have like the feeling a little bit what it meant to do this exercise.
So you breathe in and breathe out. We do this like three times. So it's actually rather calming to do this, just to focus on your breath and to slow it down a little bit. So I hope you agree with me, but I'd like for you to disagree. Um, and then we looked at how the brain changed after doing, doing these exercises and more specifically, whether the change, brain changed in different ways when doing this. Um, so what we found, so I first show what we found in the task-based networks is that um, attention always increased. So you see here is the middle line of like no change and this is more integration and this is more segregation. So you see that following presence, you see that it always becomes more segregated. Whereas um, in the retest control cohort, like it stayed a little bit around the middle, although sometimes it was a bit lower and sometimes a little bit higher. And also the other thing happened with perspective taking. There you see that overall this functional network of attention, affect and theory of mind networks, it integrated more. So this is like a pattern that you see overall, but only the difference in the theory of mind network um, made a perspective more uh, segregated than the other um, modules and, um, and theory of mind uh, more integrated than the other modules. And also theory of mind was more integrated here than the other two modules in the attention network. So if you look this at the whole brain level, you see that there's an increased um, segregation in the yellow parts with presence. So here, like these networks more, become more different from each other. Whereas with theory of mind training, these networks become more similar to each other. So they get like integrated. And you see it also rather nice here, if you look at training cohort two and three, or one and two, that it goes up in the yellow part in both cohorts. And then it stays like more or less stable during the affect module. And then it goes down with perspective taking. Um, and then, yeah, we didn't find any effect in affect. And when we looked at the principal gradient alone, and also this, the other two we've looked at, but I will take only this one as an example, we see that there are some changes in particularly the central attention um, saliency network, where these red regions, they shift upward the first gradient. So it means that these regions with affect become more close to the default mode network, which might reflect somewhat more processing that gets more related to these abstract reflective thoughts. Um, so like to put this into perspective, like there has been a lot of work uh, in the literature also uh, speaking about the default mode network, the central executive network and the saliency network and how they interrelate. And one could say that like roughly uh, the default mode network sort of maps to our notion of um, the theory of mind network, whereas the central executive network is very similar to our attention network and the saliency network is sort of the switch in between that coordinates activity in either default mode network or central executive network. And this is also kind of what we found with an like side note that we didn't find a very specific change of one network of integration and segregation, but it was more a general pattern of segregation or integration across these networks. And to me, I interpret this that the saliency network and also social affective training is sort of the thing that sort of balances this integration segregation out. Um, but um, yeah, this is also more my interpretation. And it also links to these notions of, of the dynamic brain that um, Max Schein also has, like this is of his paper. And I, I love these images, but you also see that they're like inhibitory and facilitatory neuromodulators that relate to more integrative states and more segregative states. And this is kind of also in line with what we found. So yeah, um, to sum up, social processes are embedded along intrinsic organizational axes. So particularly the axis between multiple demand network and default mode network reflect attention, social affective and social cognitive dissociation. And an integration of temporal parietal networks relate to social cognitive training, whereas their segregation relates more to attention mindfulness. And yeah, as I said, like my, my interpretation is that we do not see these changes in integration, segregation, social affective training, because it might be like more linked to balancing these two modes. But why? Um, so moving forward, um, like we will speak now a little bit about something else, namely cortical thickness, which is 
a great metric to get like a macro skill um, idea of like the underlying structure of the brain. So you measure it like follow, um, you have an MRI image, like a T1 MRI, and then you um, like segment the gray matter, white matter boundary and the gray matter pile boundary, and you tessellate it. So you create like these vertices on the brain that are these points here that are also, also connected. And you then expand this like in a balloon until you touch the next surface. And then you have a point by point correspondence, um, which measures like the thickness in millimeters. So the interesting thing is that there are multiple toolboxes in um, neuroimaging and together with Sharjat Karabi and Mazule, we measured also the differences. So overall, you see that roughly thickness, like every toolbox, like CAT, CVET, FreeSurfer, they have their own algorithm, making like there's small variations, although overall they are more or less similar. So you see a thick um, insula and temporal pole, but you see maybe a thinner uh, like unimodal cortex, like in all of these um, measures. Um, but they're also different, as you see here, like you see like um, decreases and increases when you compare the different toolboxes, which also means that cortical thickness, even if it's like a physical property of the brain, it's not something that you can generalize across toolboxes or even across versions of toolboxes. And this is important to note when you look at like different kinds of data from different sources. Um, and this may also need, lead to reprocessing data to have it like processed by the same processing pipeline. Um, so this is more a side note, but just that you know, like it's not a gold standard in that sense. Um, like it depends a little bit how you measure it with which pipeline. Um, and now we will speak about um, axis or organization of cortical thickness um, in humans and also in macaque monkeys. So this project, um, which was about shaping the cortex, um, was done in a human connecting project, young adults, S1200, uh, and also in the prime DE for the primates. And it was mostly done um, at the beginning of the first lockdown. So um, yeah, also thanks to my kids and partner here that they um, yeah, made it possible that I could work. Um, and again, it is about this idea of like that the brain is, is organized along these axes. And, and I wondered a little bit like, does this also apply to structure? And if so, how? how? Because Cortical thickness is also a way to look at the covariance between regions and like study how similar they are. So for example, here you have a seat and a target and across multiple brains. So in this case, it's six and you have a scatter plot. And you can look at whether the thickness of the seat across like say 20 people correlates with the thickness of another, the target seat. And if there is a positive correlation, you can see that there are like similar things influencing that they're like increasing like as a function of, of, of person so that there is like a covariance and other regions they do not covary. So previous people have shown that these regions of thickness they covary with each other um, because of genetic effects. So it relates also to a genetic correlation between regions. And also what you see here in the dendrogram is that there's also a certain organization of clusters. So yeah, those of you that know networks, you see here like different clusters also emerge meaning that it's also more or less organized. But yeah, the, the axis along which it is organized was not known to date. And um, another reason for why they covary, so you have like genetic correlation, but you also see that these um, regions that show covariance also mature together. So when the brain changes, you see that two regions that covary, they change in, in concord with each other. So to sum up what I just said, like microscope organizational patterns support human cognition and cortical thickness covariance relates to genetic and maturational processes. And it's also organized in communities. But how and why? So we use nonlinear dimension reduction um, to understand like the underlying patterns um, in the covariance matrix. And we created these gradients. And as you see, we found two main gradients here from more unimodal regions going to transmodal frontal regions and from superior to inferior regions. And you see that the covariance is high, highest along the axis. So with regions that are at similar levels of the gradient, you see that they have a higher covariance than with regions that are at a different level of the gradient. And you also see that this posterior anterior axis or unimodal transmodal axis correlates with the principal gradient in functional connectivity, but the second gradient does not. 
So what does this principal gradient from unimodal to transmodal really mean? So other people um, have shown by comparing humans to non-human primates that this, for example, resembles the functional reorganization in particular regions. So particularly those in the transmodal cortex, they have been reorganized most um, relative from macaques to humans. And you also see that it relates to expansion. So those parts of the brain that are in transmodal axis have expanded most, and those that are in unimodal regions have expanded least. And also this um, posterior anterior axis, which is, I'm not sure if it's the same axis, but at least it's highly similar and related. And you also see that it's like, especially like you see that it's higher, um, has a higher number of neurons, particularly in primary regions than you would expect. Um, and it relates also to neurogenesis um, end time. So in the posterior cortex, the neurogenesis ends later, whereas in the anterior cortex, the neurogenesis ends earlier. And there's also differences in um, neuron density, which is lower in anterior parts of the brain, where it's higher in posterior parts of the brain. And um, so knowing this and knowing that these axes might mean something, we also had the the idea to look at this genetic correlation and whether these axes were the same looking at the genetic correlation of this thickness. And for this, we use twins. This is actually, uh, these people are identical twins, although they look not 100% alike. And um, like the principle of genetic correlation is that you look whether the covariance or correlation structure across individuals is um, shaped by the genetic similarity between individuals. So knowing that monosychotic twins are like about 100% genetically similar and disychotic twins about 50% similar, but unrelated individuals about zero. You can do like this um, computation to see whether this covariance is different as a function of genetic similarity. And actually here, this website um, gives a really nice explanation how to compute this if you're interested. And what does genetic correlation mean? So either it means that the same uh, gene affects X and I, or via a media factor like, such as Z, and that affects X and I. But it can also mean that the gene affects X, which then um, affects I or the other way around. So it can mean multiple things. So in that sense, it's also a rather um, broad metric that one has to investigate further to really understand what is going on. So at least we could show that structural covariance was highly correlated with genetic correlation. So most. Uh, uh, covariance that we observed could be explained by genetic correlation more so than environmental correlation. And again, we also see those same axes, namely going from like unimodal posterior to um, transmodal frontal regions in the first gradient and from superior to inferior in the second gradient. Oh. So then uh, the next step, we show that it's like the axes are organized and that it also relates to genetic correlation. But then we were also interested in phylogeny. And for this, we compared humans to macaques. So we took the same step. So we took cortical thickness, we put it in parcels, and then we again made a structural covariance matrix of 41 macaques. And we did a gradient decomposition. And we found um, two main gradients again, and I colored them already for convenience. So we found one gradient but was more or less from like inferior uh, temporal regions to superior, but also you see here like posterior cingulate regions. Whereas the other region gradient was from um, sensory motor um, visual regions to more frontal polar regions. So then we wanted to compare this to humans and that's rather tricky, like comparing between different species is, is not so easy. So for this, we used um, the macaque and human alignment uh, using a joint embedding space developed by Ting Su and colleagues. And here you quickly see how this is done. Yeah, this is the same principle again. So I'll move forward. So we transformed the human gradient to macaque space for comparison, as you see here. And then we um, 
just compare the gradients with each other. And what we found is that the first gradient in humans had a positive correlation with the second gradient in macaques, which I already had colored actually for convenience more in blue, uh, yellow patterns. Whereas the second gradient in humans corresponded to the first gradient in macaques, as you see here. And this was also tested for um, spatial autocorrelation using spin tests. So um, there are axes uh, with uh, genetic correlation and they're present in humans and macaques, but what do they mean? So I show that this more posterior anterior axis relates to the functional hierarchy or um, posterior anterior patterning, but this superior inferior axis, like we couldn't explain yet. So for this, we, we looked at the notion of the dual origin theory, which um, says that you have two origins, namely the archicortex, which is in the hippocampus, and the paleocortex, which is the piriform or olfactory um, origin. And you see with these arrows, like um, it, it's like a cortical differentiation from low, medium, and high stemming from these two origins and meeting somewhere in the middle. And there's a great paper from Alexander Gulas where he actually showed that there's two, like these two streams also reflect differentiable connectivity profiles in macaques. And this, this then gives rise to this dual origin structure. So this theory has been also shown to kind of help to understand how these um, structural networks are organized in, in macaques. And we use this model um, to create a distance-based model from like the archicortex and the paleocortex, and then compare the distance from these two origins to our maps. And what we show is that the gradient two that was inferior and superior um, has a correlation that is inter, like uh, positive with the archicortex and negative with the um, and a positive with the paleocortex and negative with the archicortex. So that means that the a gradient two um, relates most uh, to this uh, dual origin, whereas the first gradient did not. And I actually had two models in which I tested this. One, it was binary because it's like not so clear whether it goes in steps or how to model this. And the other one was just gradual by taking the millimeter distance um, as a comparison. And I used the same model um, for macaques. And actually here I used the distance metrics based on the Gulas et al paper. And there you also see that the first gradient in macaques, which corresponded to the second gradient in humans, um, also showed this pattern. So the interim summary that there are axes that shape the cortex along which um, there's a genetic correlation of structure, they're present in human macaques and uh, there's this posterior anterior axis which relates to functional hierarchy but also to the posterior anterior patterning of the cortex whereas this inferior superior pattern um, related most to this theory of dual origin. So then the last part, and um, apologies whether it's maybe a little bit much, um, it's about the relationship between structure and function. So in the beginning of my talk, I spoke about functional organization, and, and then I spoke about structural organization, but like, how do we see two, where do these two meet up? And, and how can the structure of the brain like actually enable this flexible human processing? So I start with um, like a more nuanced metric, maybe of structural covariance, which is namely microstructural profile covariance. So for this, you probe um, different uh, microstructural features along um, these, like here's only three, but like along different surfaces made within the gray matter white matter boundary to the gray matter pile boundary. And with this, you can do like a, n is one uh, covariance of this microstructural profile within one individual. And this is what Casey Pacola did in the big brain. And she made a gradient of it. And there you see that it clearly goes from sensory to more uh, limbic, paralimbic regions here in red. So comparing um, these gradients actually uh, from MRI and uh, function, like these are the two principal gradients. And she also translated um, her methods to do this uh, microstructural profile covariance to in vivo imaging, you see that there's also a difference, namely that here these frontal regions are highest in uh, functional organization, whereas more these limbic, paralimbic regions are highest in microstructural organization. So taking this idea and taking this idea of these large scale axes of mesolum, but also this notion that different um, regions have different um, microstructural profiles, as you see here in, in a great paper of Garcia Cabezas, um, I explored how functional and microstructural profile covariance um, correlated with each other, indicating that if regions have a highly similarity of microstructural profile, um, whether they're also functionally connected. And this is also called the um, 
structural model by um, Babas at all, if you want to read up on it. And what you see that this is really nicely working in um, primary regions, like you see it here, and also here, the posterior insula, and also here, Ocapito regions, but it doesn't work that much in um, heteromodal and paralimbic regions, as you see here. And then I translated also these methods to macaques, and you see that also in macaques, there's a differentiation and this correlates. Um, and as you see here, I, I plotted it here also. Um, but what is interesting that in humans, it's both the heteromotor cortex as well as the paralimbic cortex that are not so related to each other. But in macaques, the pattern is slightly different. And it seems that the heteromotor parts of the cortex that are like mostly here and also reflect the default mode network and the frontal parietal control network, they have like this more similarity between functional connectivity and microstructural profile similarity. So regions that have a similar structure, they are also more likely to be functionally correlated in macaques in those regions relative to humans. So combining these ma this map with uh, the difference map also of this organizational gradients between microstructure and function, um, which I also found again in macaques. So this more or less dissociated this heteromodal default mode frontal parietal control networks from limbic networks in both humans and macaques, as you see here in the orange and in the red. I created a multidimensional uh, coupling space of um, structure function relationships, indicating on the one hand this coupling, as I just showed, and on the other hand, the differences in gradients. And I find this like I'm currently working on it and like apologies that I added it to um, actually the talk because I'm, I'm super excited about it, but it's, it's yeah, I'm, I'm in the submission process at the moment. Um, but what you see is like four quadrants of, of coupling. And, and what is nice is that you see sort of this part that is highly coupled, which is also mostly in the middle of the gradients, but then they sort of split apart in two sections in humans. One is more this um, limbic paralimbic region and the other one is more this um, Trans heteromodal default mode region, as you also see here, it's colored by the yellow colors. It's a bit better to understand. But you see that in macaques, this, this triangle sort of gets shifted. And this, especially this part of uh, the default mode from the parietal control is more coupled in macaques. Um, yeah, and I find it super interesting to think about what this means that, this, that it gets uncoupled in humans and what this can tell us about human cognition. So for this and with this, I also, <laughs> I, I'm ending now because I've, see that it's also like time to wrap it up like and what is nice is if you plot these quadrants and, and you use these quadrants to decode task-based meta-analytical data using neurosyn you see actually the different behaviors are in each quadrant more or less so you see that the upper part relates to motor and auditory processing but also attention is placed here whereas the lower lower left quadrant which is unfettered so uncoupled of microstructure and function but also higher in um the functional gradient relative to the structural microstructural gradient relates to social cognition, but also episodic and autobiographical memory. Whereas those regions that are higher in the organizational axis of microstructural relate more to emotion and affective and pain, but also face processing. So this also directly links back to, I guess, my first um, part of the talk, where I also showed that affective social cognition and attention uh, processes are differentiable and have like this different role in our um, cognitive space. So um, yeah, I kind of liked how, how the circle is, is closed and I hope um, yeah you learned something from it and you got more questions than answers uh, because that keeps us curious. So the take home is that um, human behaviors such as attention, theory of mind and compassion are embedded in large scale axes of the brain and uh, these large scale axes reflect differentiable neurogenetic organizations. And yeah, I hope that my quadrants of structure function coupling may help to understand how these flexible behaviors come about and what they mean and what kind of different dimensions are overlaid um, that help us understand behavior. So I guess now uh, the most important part of the talk, um, obviously I didn't do this alone. And um, yeah, I just started my group last year. Otherwise I, I would have loved to talk about the work of my people, but now it was like a bit dominated by my own work. Um, but yeah, thanks so much to my co-authors co and my friends and collaborators, but also Max Planck Society, Helmholtz Gemeinschaft, Heibo and Jülich um, for supporting my ideas and um, yeah, enjoying my company, I hope. And 
like extra love to my team. Like we've been remote actually since the beginning, but um, yeah, you're a really cool group of people and I'm learning so much from you each day. And yeah, um, yeah, I feel very thankful and blessed. So, and thank you guys for listening. I hope it was interesting and um, yeah. Lovely, thank you very much. Uh, the Q&A will be uh, led by Lauren Thibault, which I can see is in the room. Let me just put a pin on you. Shall I stop share that I can Everyone see you guys? Can see you. Here we go. Okay. Over to you. Thank you so much, Sophie. It was really an interesting talk. And I think you've covered a lot in the little amount of time that we had really available. And there are questions that have come through. Uh, I do have two or three questions before I open it up to the floor. Um, so the first question comes, uh, so we have, she is combining behavior measures, cortical thickness, functional imaging, and non-human primates. How easy is it to combine all of these measures? Define easy, I guess. Um, I have sleepless nights and nightmares. Um, and things do not all like, it's not like a puzzle that comes together. So there are like inconsistencies. And I guess I try to solve them. Um, but yeah, it, it's at, the, at one level, like, it's easy, because I like things to be logic and work. So it's also like making a puzzle and just seeing like, I have to say that like I have ideas in my head and, and theories of other people and I try to see if they work and I think right. they need to work at multiple levels to mm -hmm. have a meaning right or they can have meaning at one level but it's more interesting also to look at it from more angles and I'm just a curious person and I like to prove that I belong to be in science so I'm also like <laughs> working hard I guess Under understandable and also I think there because there was a sort of the sort of all these different studies taking in different um, ways to study di different aspects of um, similar things uh, themes can be difficult and so uh, one of the questions that we also have is that um, that you're interested in the uh, social brain so what is the motivation for uh, what is the motivation for studying monkeys and has she looked at social behavior in monkeys as well? Or is it really just structure based? Yeah, I think um, like I'm also interested in the social brain, um, like in general, because I, I like social interaction and I think it's super intriguing to understand like whether this is one element that makes us human. Um, and I think coming from a different angle, like if it's something that is specific to human, we should also compare it to other species, right? And, and mm -hmm. maybe the first step is to look at those species that are related or most relatively closely related to humans, namely macaque monkeys. But this is obviously like a kind of limited model. So ideally you would have more monkey species or uh, non-human primates to compare to. But to me, it all helps to answer the question, what makes us human? Um, so, but just from different angles and different parts of my history also. So I started my PhD in social neuroscience because I came from social and political philosophy. And I, I also like programming and, and understanding the brain. And then I moved to Jülich and there my task was also to look at the genetic origin. And also at the end of my PhD, I wondered a bit like, why are these social skills different? Like, what does it mean? Like, so, and that's why I turned to like more genetic and evolutionary approaches and I just love animals and I love cross-species cognition. <laughs> so it's mm -hmm. also like sort of a thing that I just love very much, which drove me to investigate it. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Mikey, from Mike Hetzberg, which is uh, in the Zoom, he's in Zoom. Uh, did the training modalities interact? For example, did training in perspective uh, taking benefit from previous effect training? It was a within design, right? Yes, um, very good question. Mike is actually my in, my working with me or for me. So uh, <laughs> it's full disclosure. Excellent question. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> she can um, know, but um, yes and no. So the idea was also that we started with this mindfulness attention so that you can sort of stabilize your mind and get acquainted to doing these complex, more meditative exercises. Um, but, and, and we do see some effects of sequence, but it's super hard to test because in the end, 
although 80 people in two cohorts is, is relatively like, it's a good sample size for these kinds of studies, but it's also limited, right? So, so it's also hard to know what is signal, what is noise. Like ideally you need to have like multiple cohorts and only two to compare whether it's super stable. So yeah, I guess that's really hard. I guess there are, we also, because it was a big team of researchers, some people went also to more experienced sampling and asked people how they experienced like the different sequences of every module. And I think that the one that ended with the affect was perceived more favorable because many people found the affective training super nice, but also super confrontational, right? To realize your negative emotions, it's also was not so easy for everyone. So yeah, I guess there are many levels to think about these, these questions. There actually. was another question actually that we had when you were talking about that. And that was looking at uh, when we were doing the breathing exercises and looking at the changes in the brain, can that not be related to the oxygen intake that um, from increased oxygen that's coming through or is it really sort of structural change or, you know? I guess I cannot deny it um, mm -hmm. with full certainty. Um, I did look at thought probes, whether people's minds were more to the future or past or um, so for others. And there was no significant relationship with what we trained. So at least they were not like thinking about uh, specifically different things in each training. And I guess that overall, all trainings were more about breathing. So it was not that people with affect training or with um, attention mindfulness training were like, breathing like super actively in the scanner and afterwards they didn't do it anymore with the other training. So uh, nevertheless, one cannot like, I cannot exclude it, right? So right. so I wouldn't know. I was also look, thinking when, when, while you were speaking about the mindfulness part of the presentation is looking at, well, how is this sort of translatable into the clinic? And so how can we, um, how can this be sort of practically useful for those who are actually like on the front, front lines, let's say? Um, yeah, I guess I'm a basic researcher, so it's also hard. Like, I have obviously dreams that it can be translated to. The well, community. even in like the future, if it could feed into other stuff, it could be sort of interesting. Yeah, I think one of the key things is that, like, I see personally, like, how to say, there are, <laughs> there are many aspects to the question, but in general, in the clinic, mindfulness has already been applied for people with certain neuropsychiatric disorders mm -hmm. although you don't want to do it with people with hallucinations for example but um i think the key part is that you can train different elements of this and it's not like mindfulness will like make you more compassionate more you cannot like hit all the birds with one stone right you need really to train mm -hmm. what you need to to maybe improve or change it but mm -hmm. it's also hard to measure what is improvement and do you want this and do you want to see meditation as self-improvement so it's Absolutely. like a whole other <laughs> debate that also like goes into this and I, I do think that thinking like for me personally learning about this and thinking about my own emotions and own roles made me at least more aware of them I don't I don't know if I became a more pleasant person <laughs> but at least um I don't know if that's even the question um like of such trainings but i do think that it's key that they are different and that if you want to change your theory of mind you shouldn't start or you can breathe obviously but that may not affect how perspective taking you are okay thank you uh we have another question from theodora hope hope hoping I'm saying that correctly. Uh, do these findings hold across both collective societies and individualized societies, or do they apply mainly to individualized societies? Um, I guess one doesn't know because we only tested this in, in individuals in, in Germany, in Leipzig and Berlin. Although one could say that maybe Berlin reflects, maybe there were more, more Western uh, Germans that were educated in a different system than people from the DDR, which were maybe more collective um, mind, but we didn't test it. And it's also hard to, it's hard to test because like about 30 years have passed since the wall fell. So again, I wouldn't know, maybe it would be okay. interesting to uh, we have a question from Leah, and she was wondering if we can find a parallelism, a parallelism between the eccentric, uh, eccentricity found in function with the, stru with the structural brain organization. Yes, um, actually, I looked at this, and it does relate also to uh, microstructure. So you see that um, 
those regions that are more um, segregated, they have, um, if I say it correct, higher T1, T2 values. Um, and it also relates, um, yeah, so it, yeah, there is some overlap. Although the default mode is suspiciously segregated, so that also <laughs> raises some questions about what that means. Um, but yeah, there is some relationship. Okay. Uh, we have a question from YouTube. Uh from Cambridge Breathes. <laughs> where uh, where do spontaneous thoughts ultimately arise? Are they cortical or subcortical or both? Any specific areas like MTL, et cetera? Mm, I don't know whether you could say, isn't like, I'm not an expert in mind wandering, but I have a wandering mind and aren't thoughts something that just are there since you're born and you just like are, are like, the flow of like the weather, the weather also doesn't have an origin. It just changes within the system. So I guess there are like, well, thinking about Max Schein and his presentation uh, a couple of weeks ago, he's really into the thalamus. And I do think the thalamus is a key organizational region coordinating these large scale networks. But I would find it hard to say what is the origin? Like mm -hmm. maybe it's like the snake that bites its own tail, right? So they're mm -hmm. different probably key modulators that may change the route it takes. But yeah, I, I wouldn't know though. There might be people saying completely different answers. Uh, we have another question from Leah and she says, uh, if, if the brain function segregation can be linked to an isolation feeling that you have in the me medi uh, meditation, for example. So can function, functional segregation be linked to an isolation feeling that you have in meditation? Mm. Like uh, absence mm -hmm. of uh, sensorial inputs, no? Yeah. That like the, mm, the brain, uh, like different regions in the brain work in segregation. So like uh, uh, you feel that there is not a link. I don't know, it's like, uh, I made this vote. Maybe, although I think, I wouldn't like overall this segregation is also when this global workspace theory, it's also associated with um, of Dehana at all, um, it's also associated with the automation of processes. So once you've mastered something and you're sort of like, I move my hand now and I try not to think about it, but I know how to move my hand. So it's like a more segregated activity, but when I'm learning something and actively making new like thoughts, like it, I'm thinking hard, then you need regions and networks to be more integrated, to have more crosstalk possible. To, to learn. And you also see this in some working memory work of um, Danielle Bassett at all. So it, it seems like this is two different states, but it might be indeed that that having the idea that your thoughts are not connected or like there's they're not a good synchrony um, between different patterns, that it is in some way reflected, but I, I wouldn't know how. And I, I just have sort of a question on looking um... At the study itself and so what had spurred you to look at mindfulness and sort of the um looking at sort of how we are towards other people and empathy that says let's say i know you said talked about your background but it's kind of a difficult i would think it would be a difficult study to sort of something to measure let's say and something mm -hmm. to say okay let's look at this let's look at this so what were the steps that you took in sort of the the, the design of the study itself or was it more of a fluid uh, just kind of happened and then one thing led to another or was it sort of this is what I want to look at exactly was it more strategic I guess is the question well I was part of a big team of, of people that studied this and this is obviously not like I was just a, a, a young PhD uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> starting so and this was part of a big ERC grant uh, that Tanya Singer got uh, who wrote it already in 2008-9 and her idea was she did this empathy for pain study and then she wondered like also having some interest in, in these like contemplative studies like can we change it can we become more empathic or more social like can we train this and this is how this setup came about and her notion was that like you have theory of mind and empathy and these are like different parts of, of social um the social brain. So she wanted to study how these different components can be manipulated and changed within training. And then we sat together like a year. Um, and also before I started as a PhD, all these researchers, part of this group sat together and came up with ideas, how to test this, how to train this also with um, people that were like teaching mindfulness in, in courses. And um, 
they made like a templative training that was not Buddhist in, in, in the sense, but we, they did take some elements of it, but they didn't make it religious, uh, obviously, because that would also create a confound. Um, so then I came as a PhD and in general, like I think training studies are a great way to understand mechanisms in the brain. Um, but it was not that I designed the study. I just, we had this big study and, and, and I guess I am interested in the social brain. So for me, it was a perfect framework to explore these different networks and how they change. Uh, okay, great. Um... I have another question uh, from a YouTube listener. So this is the last question uh, from Cambridge uh, Breeds. Is there any non-imaging studies like neurotransmitter studies that contradict the well-known fact of anti-correlation between DMN and other task-based networks? Um, yeah, there are more and more people that say that they're not really anti-correlated, but that you also see them act in concordance, but it just depends on how you um, set up your paradigm and what you contrast with what. Um, so more and more, it's not task positive versus negative, but as I said in the beginning, also Johnny, Jonathan Smallwood and others, they also thinking of it more like externally versus internal cognition, but there are also situations that you need both at the same time. I'm not sure if this answers your question, but I hope it does a little oh, bit. Sure, it does a little bit. <laughs> uh, and that's what, I just had one last question. And I know that Steffi had mentioned that you um, had sort of created your, your, uh, your group last year and sort of in the context of COVID, um, uh, how has that changed? How has that impacted, uh, let's say, your everyday life, your, uh, your, your ability to work and kind of create the group and in terms of also how you guys work? and maybe your impact on the stu on studies that are ongoing itself? Um, I guess it didn't change anything because I had no, like, I had a plan to begin with, but having never led a group, I didn't know what is normal. Mm -hmm. So I guess I tried to build it a bit like a startup that we have, like, a lot of online communication and we have, like, lab sprints every six to eight weeks where we have like more intense days or two days together where we work on one problem or one team. Um, I guess the benefit is that we have a lot more collaboration also with people like particularly Boris Bernhardt's lab in Canada. And, and this is only possible because we're all online, right? So I can just zoom in and just, or on Slack or whatever, just say, hey, I have this question, right? And it's, it's like we're office mates with, with Casey <laughs> and all those people. And so in that sense, it, made my lab also more connected and like being also affiliated with Jülich it was also rather convenient that I don't need to take the train but I can be there even being here and I can teach and um yeah obviously it also is like personally I have two young kids so that like it's difficult with like how to allocate free time and work time and with my partner and I'm was super lucky he was composing his album last year so that we could like do a 50 50 care versus work routine although one could also say that's unfair because like he was just composing music and i was setting up a lab but i think one can have like a lot of discussions about um work life balance and parenthood but that was super like a good thing and um i was super tired obviously and uh i had like now i have a super stiff neck because i have to get like a, a screen <laughs> to work on so <laughs> there are some hiccups in my system or my setup um yeah i'm trying to be also more yeah make the best of the situation and i think like a lot of our studies also because it's so um we use a lot of big data or like different things such as this, the first study that I presented was actually still part of my PhD, right? So it's also some older data and I try to, um, yeah, use open data as much as possible and, and make sure that all the PhDs or all the projects that people start in my lab are not dependent on COVID, but they can happen no matter what. Um, but obviously I should elbow my way into the scanner uh, waiting line at Max Planck to also get like my own data and maybe share it with the community at some point. And, yeah, this is something that I now need to start thinking about now. Vaccinations most, are yeah, most 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 researchers are sort of in the same position, kind of looking at you know how we can sort of the data collection within the COVID times. But thank you so much for your for your your talk. It was really interesting, and thanks for joining us. Of course, just a quick reminder to every uh, everybody so that every Monday uh, at nine thirty a.m. Paris time we have Neurochino. So come 
bring a paper, bring a coffee, and let's chat about science. And the next uh, event will be a CNS talk, hashtag CNS talk, uh, where we will be hosting uh, Dr. Alfredo Spagna, who will talk about human attentional networks and their development. It'll be fantastic. And it'll be on the 29th of April at 4 p.m. Paris time. So we look forward to having you all join us again uh, on the 29th of April. Thanks again, Sophie. Thanks for everyone for your time. And uh, feel free to, sh to share, share the video and share the love. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Thank you. Bye. I'll just sit here yeah. and wave goodbye. <laughs> I'll join you. <laughs> like the queen, like the Dutch queen.